Greetings people, it's Paul at Greenshire Homestead. I'm going to talk to you about my uh, root cellar. My wife and I built this last year and uh, <clears throat> we built it out of earth bags. A lot of you have probably seen those uh, on YouTube videos. They're like the sand bags that they use for flooding. It's uh, bags two foot long, I think 14 inches wide. And uh, our uh, buddy came out, dug a hole here um, in this slope and he piled all the dirt from the hole back yonder behind it. And then we used all the dirt, uh, or not all the dirt, but the, we, we filled the bags, the earth bags with the dirt that came out of the hole. We used 600 earth bags and uh, what dirt was left over after we filled all the bags uh, is what went on the roof. So um, the hole is eight feet deep. And after he dug the hole, we went around the inside of the hole, we dug a trench and then we laid Schedule 40 PVC in there for uh, drainage. Uh, use landscape fabric and then uh, uh, clean gravel. So I don't think it'll happen, but if any water does get get through to where it's wanting to make its way into the root cellar, it'll uh, go down into that, um, you know, it'll find the low spot, which is the, the, the trench, go through the Schedule 40, out underneath the ground here, underneath the driveway, and out into the pasture. Then uh, after the hole was dug, <coughs> I took heavy duty landscape fabric, I started on one end and I laid the fabric down the wall, across the floor and up the other side and out. So if you can picture that, the entire um, inside of the hole was covered with uh, heavy duty um, landscape fabric. And then um, I put six inches of gravel across the entire floor and then we started stacking the earth bags and I left a, a space a foot wide between the the wall of the you know the dirt wall of the hole and the earth bag, I, I left a foot. So as we got a row of, of earth bags stacked, <clears throat> you, you stack them and then you tamp them flat. And then uh, every time I, I put a layer of earth bags, I backfilled between the wall and the earth bags with clean gravel. So all the way up is earth bags and then clean gravel, then the landscape fabric, then the the wall. So if you can picture that in your head. And, and that way, if, like I said, I don't think it'll happen, but if any moisture tries to get through the wall to the earth bags, it'll hit that clean gravel, go all the way down, and then out. And I don't think this will happen either, but if the ground heaves in there at all, I don't think it will, because there's enough uh, soil up here and enough um, thermal mass that I don't think that the, the ground is gonna be able to shift down that deep. But if it were to uh, shift, that clean gravel would keep the wall from, from pushing in on the earth bags. That gravel would shift enough that the earth bags would be untouched. So this thing ought to last for generations. And the roof is made of utility poles. What I did was I, I took posts, utility pole posts, and I've got three posts on each side. So there's one in the front, one in the middle, one in the back on both sides. And then down the middle, there's just two posts down the middle. The posts are set on a footer, and then on top of the posts, I've got on the on the edges, I've got a 16-foot utility pole, and down the middle, I've got a 10-foot utility pole. So again, if you can picture that in your mind, the posts are set, the the utility pole beams are across that, and and then um, from all the way across in one one 14-foot uh, swath, I've got uh, 22 utility poles that comprise the roof. And where those utility poles sit on those beams, I notched them with my chainsaw so they sit down onto the beam, kind of like you would do with a, uh, a log home. So that keeps everything locked in together. There won't be any shifting or rolling or anything. It's all locked in together. You won't be able to see the posts or the beams on the outside because they're fully uh, encapsulated into the wall system, but you will be able to see the posts and the beam down, down the center. When we go in, I'll show you that. So. After the roof is flat, this, the, the hump here in the middle is just because we piled the dirt up higher in the middle. So the utility poles are flat and on top of the utility poles I then put um, a thick layer of cardboard and then on top of the cardboard uh, this thick, this is a heavy duty pond liner. I got, I got a pond liner that was long enough, uh, wide enough to go past the edges of the roof and long enough to go past the, uh, the far far end of the roof there so uh, it sticks out on all sides at least as far as this does right here 
and that way, uh, like I said, it doesn't matter how much rain falls on this, it can't get through into the root cellar, it's going to run off the sides. And on top, this pond liner's slick, so on top of that, before I put, put the dirt down, I put six inches of uh, hay on top of the pond liner. And, you know, that hay was put on thick and it's all intertwined with itself. And then I put a, a foot and a half of dirt on top of that hay. The reason I put the hay down was because this is so slick, I was worried that if we had a really heavy rain and that moisture got through to the pond liner, it's going to pool on the pond liner. And I was afraid that that might the dirt might want to then kind of bleed off the sides. Even though the roof is flat, I was afraid there'd be too much shifting of the soil because it would basically be too muddy. So that, that thick layer of, of uh, hay in there um, gives keeps the, the dirt from being in contact with the actual pond liner and just gives a little more structural integrity for the dirt to hold on to until which time the grass up here, uh, the root system in the grass then binds the, the uh, earth together. So that's, that's what we've got. This is um, just regular your, your, you know, metal roofing. On the other side of this metal is the earth bags that, that are on the front side. And uh, eventually this top is going to be right here all, all the way across. is going to be a hedge tree po um, trunk. And then underneath the hedge tree trunk all the way down here to the planting bed is going to be uh, oak siding. And I'm going to make that look, you know, more or less like clapboard siding. So, uh, you know, if you haven't figured it out, this is supposed to be, you know, similar in appearance to a hobbit house, except it doesn't have a round door. And then uh, the rock here on the corners, that, that is just to stabilize the dirt, you know, from, from shifting down this way. It gives it some structural integrity. I'm having a little problem in this corner because my dog keeps running off in the timber and finding dead stuff and bringing it back up here and trying to bury it over here in this soft dirt. So I put that cinder block there to discourage her from from digging in it, which which did work. Um, so I've, I've got to go uh, scrounge up some more rock, and then I'm going to stick more rock here in this corner, and then I got to backfill more because over here on this side, um, where the roof ends, we just we you know it's just piled up dirt. Well, that dirt is settled throughout the winter, which you know we knew we knew was going to happen. So I'm going to have to come back in on this side and and put some more dirt um, where it's settled, and then reseed it and put more hay on it which isn't a big deal and you know I knew that was going to happen. So <clears throat> I'm going to go at the, the rest of this. This is all going to be planted with flowers and herbs. I'm going to put a little fence around the front of it and that's going to really add to the uh, you know the Hobbit house appearance. So um, I'll go around the back and uh, show you what it looks like from the rear. Okay so here you can see we've, we've got you know more or less a flat area and then you can see the hump there and that is where the uh, root cellar obviously is. I've regraded all of this so that we the ground slopes away from the house. But in this one particular area here where you know the, the hump the hump of the root cellar slopes toward the retaining wall. How I've uh, taken care of that issue is I put a rain gutter in there and so that pond liner feeds right to that rain gutter. There is soil on top of it but the pond liner goes all the way to that rain gutter so as water comes off of the slope from the center of the root, root cellar to the south here, instead of going down between the root cellar and the retaining wall, it's going to hit that um, rain gutter and then be taken out to the front. So we will still you know, have some moisture there between the root cellar and the retaining wall, but it's going to be minimal because the majority of the water is going to flow out that, that rain gutter. That's how I did that. So that pipe right there is a vent, and I'll talk about that when we get inside. Here on this uh, side, you can see, you can kind of see a, where it's coming along and then it drops off, and that's where the um, the roof ends and the, the dirt is mounted, and you can see there where I'm going to have to do some backfilling. Not a lot, just probably three or four uh, wheelbarrow loads of dirt will be enough, and then I'll reseed that. We've got plenty of dirt, we've got plenty of grass seed, and we've got plenty of hay, so that's not going to be an issue. Just, uh, just take a little bit of time. Go on inside here. So here you see the gravel floor I was talking about, the six inches of gravel on it. Um, I've got the the main beam there in the 
in the middle and I've, I've uh, notched out those utility poles so they sit down onto that and that gives, uh, uh, you know, there won't be any shifting or, or rolling of the logs. Everything's very well, um, very sturdy. And uh, the gap there between the wall and the uh, ceiling, I, I left that gap there because I assume there will be some settling. And uh, after, I'm going to wait one more year and then I'm going to spray foam the area between the uh, utility poles and the earth bags to seal it up completely. But it was, it, I, th I thought it was important. That I didn't want all that pressure pushing down on the, uh, on the earth bags. So that's why I left that gap and, and then we'll go ahead and spray foam that to seal it up real good. The thermometer here, you can see um, that bottom line here is uh, 40 degrees and then there's a uh, writing that says made in the USA and then the mercury is below that made in the USA so it's bang on 38 degrees. It's, it's never not been 38 degrees since it equalized in here. It's working better than I thought. <coughs> Those beets right there, um, my wife and I don't eat the beets. We feed them to the chickens. We're just not beet fans, but the chickens love them. And it's a good um, way of, of growing a lot of food that we can feed our chickens, you know, should there be a problem uh, where we would not be able to get store-bought feed. This is a good staple that, that they can eat. The leaves on there are new. And that's what I mean. This is working better than I thought. I had removed the leaves from there, and you know I feed those to the to the chickens as well, and the leaves are growing back. I I thought that they were just gonna the beets were gonna sit idle, but they're act actively growing. Um, that surprised me. So um, I pulled those leaves off. In fact, I did yesterday. I, not all of them, but I pulled some leaves off and fed them to the chickens yesterday. But what those are is. Uh, those are feed sacks that when the feed sacks empty I cut the top off and I roll the, the sides down then I put the beets in and then I add damp, damp sand so that's the only thing that's in there is damp sand and beets and I, I get the sand from my creek and so that's free um, you know we're re reusing the, the, the bags they'll last for years and, and that way we're putting less waste into the landfill and we're reusing that material and it works really really well so um, th those, you know, the, the, those are beets there, and then I've got some cabbage down here, and then uh, we've got kale over there, and then the carrots here, and uh, more beets. And then there's the last of our uh, butternut squash. We also had a dozen pumpkins in here. Uh, there's a little bitty one there, but we had uh, a dozen full-size pumpkins in here, and we feed those to the chickens as well. And I just fed them the last pumpkin uh, first part of February, this is mid-February, and that pumpkin was still as firm the, in February as, as it was in October when we put it in here. So that's why this is really working well. Um, those are the carrots there. Uh, again, they are continuing to grow. They, they have, there is new carrot tops since I put them in here in October. They're not growing a lot, but um, the the, t the tops are actively growing so I know they're healthy and when I put these things back in the ground in, in uh, the spring they're gonna I know it's gonna work those are uh, there's t about a dozen carrots right there in those six pots and out of those carrots I'll get about 5,000 seeds and then we'll, we'll save 10 of the beets that we won't feed to the chickens and out of 10 beets I'll get about 4,000 seeds so it that you know that's where I'm saying you can really be self-sufficient with this because the amount of seed you get out of these biannuals is is just tremendous. Uh, you just need to be able to keep them alive through the winter. So that pipe there uh, lets lets fresh air in and stale air, air out, and it also lets out the ethylene gas because some of the vegetables are going to produce ethylene gas, and what that does is help things to uh, it promotes things to ripen. Well. In an enclosed area like this, if ethylene gas builds up too much, it will actually cause things to over ripen, which then promotes rot. So <clears throat> that's why you have to vent the ethylene gas out. The, the coolness in here of the root cellar, that 38 degrees is acting like a refrigerator without electricity. And that is what's keeping these um, everything in here 
more fresh and, and healthy is the cool temperature. These watering cans here are, are not used for watering these plants. You do not water the plants when they're in the root cellar. When, when you put the damp sand in there, you just leave it alone after that because if you continue to add water, you're, you're gonna, it's going to be too damp and then the, the uh, beets and the carrots and such are going to rot. So damp sand, one time, bam, you're done. Just leave the plants alone and they'll be fine. What we use the water for is you have to have a high humidity level in a root cellar and uh, that humidity needs to be around 80 85 percent so i literally just dump that on the floor and um, it goes down through the gravel and then it evaporates and then that that uh, that gives you that high humidity level and that's what we use that water for about every 10 days to two weeks i'll dump two gallons of water on the floor so here you see that main beam i think i showed you that already and then the posts uh, go down and they're on a footer the footer is two feet by two feet and then three feet deep concrete footer under each of those posts so that's what looks that's what it looks like on the outside of the wall where the 16 foot beams are uh, same exact setup just on the outside of the wall so um, <clears throat> that is w what our root cellar looks like on the inside right now it's a little haphazard and kind of ugly because we were in a mad dash we finished this thing in September and then we had other chores and things we had to do here on the homestead so the harvest was was fast and I just threw shelving in here uh, next year we're gonna have much more professional looking shelving and we're gonna actually store food in here that we're gonna eat everything in here right now is just either for the chickens or um, to replant for seed so next year we'll have actual food in here that we're gonna consume and uh, the biennials that we're going to store. So we'll have a lot more stuff in here. We'll have a lot more shelving. I'll do another video to show you more of a final product. Uh, the root cellar itself is done, uh, but the um, you know we we've, we've got to get the interior here uh, lined out and a little more um, clean and professional. So that's what we've got with our root cellar. Uh, this is Paul at Greenshire Homestead. If you're thinking about a root cellar, I highly recommend it. This is how our pioneer ancestors lived, and this is a real good way of storing food uh, for the future should uh, there be a problem. And if there's not a problem, it's still a good way of storing food. So we'll see you next time at Greenshire. Thanks for watching.